Let's go ahead and get started. Tonight we're going to, Lord willing, uh, do two more chapters in our Bible study through Second Chronicles as we make our way on Thursday nights through the Bible, book by book and chapter by chapter and verse by verse. So uh, we'll begin in chapter 11. We uh, left off in chapter 10 last week, and uh, so our uh, study will be in chapters 11 and 12. So you can go ahead and turn there at this time. And uh, before we uh, jump in, let's pray and we'll ask God to bless our time together in his word tonight, if you would join with me. Loving Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We love your word so much, too. And we really look forward to our Bible studies on Thursday nights because it's an opportunity for us to just be able to set aside and not think about all the busyness of our lives, especially this time of year as stressful as it can be. This is a, a sanctuary for us, an opportunity for us to just quiet our hearts and open up our hearts to receive from you. Lord, we're with anticipation looking to you to minister to us and to speak into our lives in and through your word. So Lord, will you speak now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1, Second Chronicles 11. Now, when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled from the house of Judah and Benjamin 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against Israel that he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam. But, verse 2, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin, saying, Thus says the Lord, You shall not go up or fight against your brethren. Let every man return to his house. And then, this is really interesting, For this thing is from me. Now, if you were with us last week, you'll remember, I think it was verse 15 of chapter 10, where we're told that there was this turn of events that were actually brought about by God. In other words, God was in the turn of events. What turn of events? Well, the turn of events were a split in the kingdom of Israel. You have the split between the north and the south. And there were those who would not follow the king after Solomon had died and left the throne to his son. So that created a split within the kingdom. And we're told that this was a turn of events that was from the Lord, that actually the Lord had brought about. And here again in verse 4, we're told that this thing is from me. In other words, God had brought it about. And we're even told why in chapter 10, verse 15. It's so that it would fulfill the word of the Lord. In other words, this was in accordance with God's word and God's will. And here we see it again. For this thing is from me. Therefore, they obeyed the words of the Lord and turned back from attacking Jeroboam. That's a good thing. <laughs> So the chapter begins by introducing us to this Shemaiah, who we're told was a man of God, and he had a word from God for this king Rehoboam. And to his credit, he heeds this word from God, from this man of God, and is spared from what would have arguably been a devastating defeat had he gone up with that many men against Israel he would have been dealt a de devastating blow I find it interesting that in this chapter and we'll see it again in the next chapter this is the only time we hear about this Shemaiah and uh, then he just kind of disappears from the pages of Scripture 
Charles Spurgeon had an interesting take on this. He says, here is one Shemaya. Some of you never heard of him before. Perhaps you will never hear of him again. He appears once in this history, and then he vanishes. He comes, and he goes. Only fancy this one man constraining to peace a hundred and eighty thousand chosen men, warriors ready to fight against the house of Israel by giving to them in very plain, unpolished words the simple command of God. And he says this, Why have we not such power? Peradventure, brethren, we do not always speak in the name of the Lord, or speak God's word as God's word. If we are simply tellers out of our own thoughts, why should men mind us? There's two sides to this coin, for lack of a better way of saying it. You have the one side where you have this man of God with this word of God who, in speaking forth this word of God, exercises much power to stay the hand of 180,000 men. And then on the other side of it, you have the recipient of this man of God with a word from God. I wonder how many times has God sent a Shemaiah into our lives to speak God's word into our lives. One of the things I'm learning in my walk with the Lord is that God is always speaking. The question isn't, is God speaking to me? The question is, am I listening? And sometimes I can't hear the voice of God because the volume in my life is turned up too loud. The busyness of my life is such that it drowns out that still small voice of the Holy Spirit. One of the things that God will not do is he will not shout or yell to get our attention. In high school, I had a biology teacher that was really soft-spoken. His name was Mr. Bowman. And leave it to me, I was, sorry to say, the class clown. And he would speak in this real soft tone. And, and I would yell out, teacher, speak up. I can't hear you. To which he would say, no, I'm not going to speak up. This is how I speak. If you want to hear me, you need to quiet down. I'm not going to speak up. And I think oftentimes that's how it is with the Lord in our lives. The Lord isn't going to raise his voice. He's not going to speak up. We need to be able to hear him speak in that still small voice. Verse 5, so Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. And he built Bethlehem, Etam, Tico, Beit Zur, Socha, Adulam, Gath, Marisha, Zif, Adoraim, Lachish, Azika, Zora, Aijalon, and Hebron, which are in Judah, and Benjamin, fortified cities. And, verse 11, he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them and stores of food, oil, and wine. Also in every city he put shields and spears and made them very strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. And from all their territories, the priests and the Levites who were in all Israel took their stand with him, for the Levites left their common lands and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem, for Jeroboam and his sons had rejected them from serving as priests to the Lord. Then, if you can imagine this, he appointed for himself priests for the high places, for the demons and the calf idols which he had made. And after the Levites left, those from all the tribes of Israel, such as set their heart to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice to the Lord God of their fathers. 
Here we're told that the Levites defected from Jeroboam. If, if you get confused between Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the easiest way to remember it, well, at least for me anyway, is Rehoboam is in Jerusalem, which starts with a J, and Jeroboam is in the north. That probably didn't help at all, did it? Probably made it worse. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> but So Jeroboam in the north had been fully given over to the idolatrous worship of false gods and we're told even demons. And this after Rehoboam had built and fortified the cities for a defense in Judah against the potential threat from Jeroboam in the north. And he was a threat. He did pose a threat. And this as Jeroboam constructs an altar and appoints for himself his own priests for the high places and the calf idols. I'm gonna, uh, I wish we had the screen, but um, I have a picture here of, for those of you who went to Israel with us, you'll remember uh, this actual altar. We visited this uh, exact site in Tel Dan, where Jeroboam had uh, built this calf idol worship altar. And he, he basically constructed it and in the north so that the Israelites would not go to Jerusalem to worship. It's not so much that he did it, it's why he did it. And what motivated him to do it was really fear. He feared that he would lose his kingdom to Rehoboam. And the reason being is, is that had the Israelites traveled all the way back to Jerusalem, the kingdom would have likely reverted to the house of David. And this was exactly what he was trying to avoid. And it's for this reason that he builds this site and institutes this newly ordained feast. And in so doing, he's doing everything he can to make it convenient for the Israelites to stay there in the north and worship at this altar that he created. Here's the problem. Such a convenience will come packaged with the idolatrous worship of these demonic false gods. And I know that we don't have Jeroboam's altars with golden calves here on the island for us to conveniently worship at, but the problem is, is that they're still alive and well today. And the reason I say that is there are what I'll call these Tel Dan churches today that seek to make this type of worship both easy and especially convenient. If you were to ask me what I thought was one of the most subtle dangers in the life of a Christian, it would have to be convenient Christianity. Convenient Christianity. When it comes to worshiping and serving the Lord, oftentimes that which is convenient has built-in dangers, more specifically as it relates to our compromising under the banner of convenience. This is the problem, I think. We, we live in a convenient society. Everything has to be convenient. We have convenience stores. We have microwave ovens that are convenient. They're quick. They're easy. They're time-saving. And the problem is, is that there's this built-in danger when it comes to the worship of the Lord. And this is exactly what happened in the north. Verse 17, so they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong for three years because they walked in the way of David and Solomon for three years. Then Rehoboam took for himself as wife Mahalath, the daughter of Jeremoth, the son of David, and of Abihail, the daughter of Ilya, the son of Jesse, and she bore him children, Jaush, Shemariah, and Zaham, after he took Maacha, the granddaughter of Absalom, remember Absalom? And she bore him Abijah, Atai, Ziza, and Shalamath. Those are some names for you. If you're thinking about picking out a name, you might want to 
Now Rehoboam, verse 21, loved Maacha, the granddaughter of Absalom, more than all his wives and his concubines. Oh, he had many wives and concubines. That's exactly what we're going to see here. For he took 18 wives, wow, and 60 concubines, and begot 28 sons and 60 daughters. And Rehoboam, verse 22, appointed Abijah, the son of Maacha, as chief to be leader among his brothers, for he intended to make him king. He dealt wisely and dispersed some of his sons throughout all the territories of Judah and Benjamin to every fortified city, and he gave them provisions in abundance. He also sought many wives for them. So what an end to a chapter, and what an end to a man, actually, who repeats the folly of his father Solomon by multiplying for himself all these wives and concubines. The thought is, is that had Rehoboam not done this, his reign of peace and prosperity, the blessing of God on his reign would have lasted for many more years. However, we're told it was only really three years that it lasted because he did this. I think this is another danger in the life of a Christian. It's the danger of prosperity. Prosperity can be very dangerous for those who are not well equipped to handle it and be good stewards of it. The prosperity seems to have done to him what prosperity does to the best of men, which is that it ultimately corrupts them and leads them to their downfall. G. Campbell Morgan said it this way, He was, however, the son of his father, and even in the years of peace and prosperity, the animal nature came out in the multiplicity of wives and concubines until he had practically established, as did his father, a harem on the pattern of the corrupt kings around him. As we talked about last week, God commanded the kings not to multiply for themselves wives, not to multiply for themselves horses, and not to multiply for themselves gold. We know to be true that Solomon did all of the above in spades and the reason why the command was not to do this was because in the end it would lead them away from the Lord. And this is exactly what had happened. Jesus said in Matthew 6, you cannot serve two masters. He did not say you should not. Uh, you would be well advised not to. I would suggest that you don't try. No, he said you cannot. It is an impossibility. It is one or the other. And what happens is oftentimes money and prosperity become the God in one's life. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now, it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, and here it is, that he forsook the law of the Lord, and this is sad, and all Israel along with him. In other words, he took Israel down the path in his forsaking of the Lord. Something very important here in this first verse that I want to point out, and it has to do with how we're prone to depend upon God when we really don't have any other alternative or any other choice. And then conversely, when we have resources, then we become independent from God. And this is exactly what had happened with Rehoboam. It's interesting, he forsook the Lord, we're told, once he had become established and strengthened. In and of himself, he was confident, he was established, he was strong in his own might and no longer needed the Lord. And is this not how it is for us? We can become independent of God after he's blessed us and prospered us. And is that not ironic? It's ironic because the blessing from God and the trusting in God 
comes from our dependence upon God. And what comes from that is blessing and prosperity. And then we get so blessed and so prosperous, we forget the Lord. And we no longer trust in the Lord. We trust in ourselves. We trust in our own abilities, our own resources. This is Proverbs 28, verse 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, <laughs> but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. Verse 2, And it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. Stop. Did you catch that? God allowed Egypt to come up against Jerusalem. Why? Because they had transgressed against the Lord. Listen, when we're walking in the ways of the Lord, God will keep our enemies at bay. He will protect us. But when we turn from the Lord, God will oftentimes allow our enemies. I think of the Proverbs that says, when a man's ways are pleasing to him, he makes even his enemies to live at peace with him. And this is true not just for a nation. This is especially true for a Christian as well. So Egypt comes up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. And verse 3, they came with 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horsemen, and get this, people without number, too numerous to count, who came with him out of Egypt, the Lubim and the Sukim and the Ethiopians. And verse 4, he took the fortified cities of Judah and came to Jerusalem. Isn't that what we just read? That Rehoboam had fortified the cities of Judah? Well, that didn't last very long. Then, here's Shemaiah again, verse 5. Then Shemaiah the prophet came to Rehoboam and the leaders of Judah who were gathered together in Jerusalem because of Shishak and said to them, Thus says the Lord. Listen, whenever you read in God's word, Thus saith the Lord, <laughs> you really want to pay attention to what the Lord has to say in that moment. And this is what Shemaiah says from the Lord. You have forsaken me. And therefore, I also have left you in the hand of Shishak. Now we're told and promised in God's word that God will never leave us or for, forsake us. But here's the thing. We're also told that if we forsake him, he will forsake us. And we just read that Rehoboam had forsaken the Lord and in turn, God had forsaken him. You have forsaken me and therefore I also have left you in the hands of Shishak. And then verse 6, this is good. <laughs> so the leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and they said, the Lord is righteous. Now verse 7, when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah saying, they have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them. Boy, that was close. <laughs> but I will grant them some deliverance. My wrath shall not be poured out on Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, verse 8, they will be his servants. And here's the reason, and it's very interesting, that they may distinguish my service from the service of the kingdoms of the nations. Wow. In other words, you want to forsake me and serve other gods? You want to forsake me? Well, I'm going to show you. I'll never force myself on you. If you want to forsake me, here's what will happen when you forsake me. And you'll know. And you'll see the difference. You think it's hard serving me? Try serving other gods and see what happens. 
It's as if God is saying, I will give you over to that which you are pursuing. There's this proverb that has always haunted me all of my life. It basically goes like this. It's a paraphrase. This is the gist of it. What you pursue will pursue you. In other words, if you pursue righteousness, righteousness will pursue you. And conversely, if you pursue evil, evil will pursue you. Listen, you go looking for it, <laughs> not only will you find it, it will find you. You're looking for trouble, <laughs> not only will you find it, it will find you. And this is what God is basically saying to them. You're going to be able to distinguish my service from the service of the kingdoms of the nations. So we're told, verse 9, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took everything. Everything. <laughs> he also carried away the gold shields which Solomon had made. Then King Rehoboam made bronze shields in their place and committed them to the hands of the captains of the guard who guarded the doorway of the king's house. Wow. Just wow. <laughs> if you're anything like me, and I suspect that you are, you're probably having just as hard of a time as I am trying to wrap your mind around how this could happen. Think about this. Think about this. It's, remember all of the tons, tons, literally tons of gold? And we're told that he took everything? You mean he took all the gold? Yes. Everything. And God allowed it. Well, <laughs> wait a minute. Rehoboam is Solomon's son, right? Right. You mean to tell me that the, the splendor and the magnificence of Solomon's temple, and it was splendid and it was magnificent, lasted for only one generation? Yes. You mean to tell me that the blessing of God can be lost in the span of one generation? Yes. Yes. Dare I say that this is why we have accounts like this in our Bibles? Should this not put the fear of God in our hearts? The fear of God. This is what happens. And then, <laughs> when the gold shields are taken, because again, everything was taken, what do they do? They make bronze shields instead. What a cheap substitute. Remember, I think it was a couple weeks ago, we were reading about all the gold that the queen of Sheba brought to Solomon. And it, it was like silver, we're told, was of no value. It was, it was basically worthless. It had no silver. How much is silver selling for for an ounce? I wouldn't mind having a, <laughs> a few ounces slash pounds. I'll take some tons of it, you know. It was of no value. And some have calculated how, how much in today's money the gold would have been worth. And if the silver was of no value, then what in the world was the bronze worth? Well, there's a deeper meaning here and a, a deeper symbolism here. Gold in the scriptures is a type of deity. Gold is a, a type of royalty. It, in typology, points to God. And bronze, in terms of the typology, points to judgment. Remember the bronze serpent that Moses was commanded to make and put on a pole, which by the way, in the shape of a cross, is where we get our modern 
day symbol for medicine. It's the snake on the pole. And if the Israelites would but look upon this bronze serpent on the cross, they would be healed by faith. It was a type of the judgment of God that Jesus the Christ would take upon himself on that cross. And it was represented by the bronze. Do you see where this is going? The cheap substitute of the bronze in place of the gold? The judgment of God? How apropos Adam Clark of this judgment writes, They shall be preserved and serve their enemies, that they may see the difference between the service of God and that of man. While they were pious, they found the service of the Lord to be perfect freedom. When they forsook the Lord, they found the fruit to be perfect bondage. A sinful life is both expensive and painful. Can I say that again? A sinful life is both expensive and painful. G. Campbell Morgan had some pretty good insight on this. He says, the picture of Rehoboam's substitution of brass for gold is unutterably pathetic. Yet, how often do the people of Jehovah masquerade among, amid imitations? because they have lost the things of pure gold through unfaithfulness and sin. This is why it is, I believe, that some churches have to manufacture this cheap substitute to try to make up for that which was long ago removed, namely the Spirit of God, the anointing of God, where did it go? Oh, it left when the Word of God left. It left when the Word of God left. And that's why you have to create all this hype. You have to have the lights flashing and you got to have things shaking and moving and that's a cheap substitute for what's not there. The Holy Spirit. You know, one of the things that the Lord really ministered to me early on when I entered the ministry as a pastor and a teacher of God's Word is that it's not my job to get your attention and keep your attention. <laughs> First of all, if it was, shoot me now. I, are you kidding me? I mean, I got to be hip and cool. That's a problem right there. Because <laughs> I'm not. I'm not hip. I'm not cool. <laughs> what you see is what you get. I think of the pastors in churches today, the, the crushing pressure they're under to perform. To perform. And I love it because... The Lord just reminds me that all I have to do is stand up here and preach the Word. Just preach the Word. Oh, but the problem is, is that sometimes, especially when you're in Second Chronicles, it can be a little bit boring. And what's this with the Old Testament? Isn't the Old Testament old? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> are, you, are you kidding me? I mean, some of the richest times in God's Word for us as a church. Have they not been on a Thursday night <laughs> when we've been in the Old Testament? For those of you who are with us, when we were in Samuel and Kings, studying the life of David. Listen, I, I've had so many people tell me that they were just so blessed in the study of the life of David. What a guy, man. What, what a man of God, a heart after God's own heart. And so many lessons 
that we learn from this man and all the graphic detail that was included in the pages of a holy writ about how badly he sinned against God, committing adultery and murder, two crimes under the law that were punishable by death, and yet God was merciful to David. God was gracious to David, and he tried to cover it up for a year. And then God sent the prophet Nathan, and he said to David, you are that man. And David broke, and he humbled himself, and he repented. And I'll tell you, for me personally, and I know I've shared this before, that in many ways I enjoy teaching the Old Testament more than I do the New. That's not to say that I don't enjoy teaching the New. We're in 2 Corinthians on Sunday mornings, and I mean, it, it, it's, sometimes it's tough stuff. It's tough stuff. But when you understand the Old Testament, it brings light and even life to the New Testament. It's the whole counsel of God. And all I have to do, the only thing God requires of me is to be faithful to His Word. To teach and preach His Word. The whole counsel of God. No cheap substitutes. No horse and pony show. No hot dogs and balloons. <laughs> no free iPads. True story. Free iPad given on an Easter Sunday morning by a church. That's sort of a door prize. Listen, it, if the Holy Spirit doesn't have your attention, there's nothing I can do to have your attention. It, this is what I love about Thursday nights too, is I look out and I, I see you here tonight, sitting on those hard chairs. By the way, <laughs> our nice, soft, comfortable, padded, thick, on the back two chairs, they shipped, right? They're shipped? Or are they gonna, they're going to ship. On the 23rd, and we're going to have them in January. Praise the Lord. <laughs> now the rapture can happen right after we get those chairs. But, so, but you come here on a Thursday night, and I know you're as tired as I am. And isn't it true when, uh, before you come to church on Thursday night, a tiredness and an exhaustion just sets in? And you come to church and... You start worshiping, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm so glad I came. So glad I came. And the tiredness is gone. I really believe it's the enemy trying to keep... Uh, the same thing happens when we try to pray. You've ever noticed when you set your heart to pray? <laughs> I mean, the phone rings. I mean, you get indigestion. Uh, you get a splitting headache all of a sudden out of nowhere. You're tired all of a sudden. The kids start fighting. <laughs> Everything just starts happening. Why do you think that is? The enemy doesn't want us to pray, and the enemy sure, surely does not want us sitting under the teaching of God's Word, let alone being in God's Word. I think it's sad. I feel sorry for those who have acquiesced to the need to fabricate, manufacture, cheap substitutes for that which could so easily be there if they would just be faithful. I was um, listening to a teaching by Damien Kyle. My wife had uh, told me about it, and so I listened to it. And he's the pastor of Calvary Chapel Modesto. He's one of the best Bible teachers I believe we have in the world today. And he made a comment about how we're going to hear those words on that great and final day. Well done, good and faithful servant. And he says this, he says, we're not going to hear well done, good and popular servant. Right? We're not going to hear well done, good and productive servant. We're not even going to hear 
And, and think about this one. We're not even going to hear, well done, good and fruitful servant. What we're going to hear is, well done, good and faithful servant. It's just remaining faithful. And Rehoboam did not remain faithful. Faithful. Verse 11. Whenever the king entered the house of the Lord, the guard would go and bring them out, speaking of these bronze cheap substitutes, then they would take them back into the guard room. And then verse 12 is really interesting. When he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him so as not to destroy him completely. <laughs> and things also went well in Judah. I like verse 12. <laughs> verse 12 gives me hope. Verse 12 is what I would call a close call. In other words, we're, we're told that he humbled himself and then God turned and didn't destroy him. Does that mean that had he not humbled himself, God would have destroyed him? Yes! Wow! <laughs> okay. You know that proverb that says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up? You know, I, <laughs> this is the JDV. Can I say it that way? This is what I'm learning. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord before He does it for you. Oh, and He will. <laughs> he will. But in the midst of such judgment, this had to have been just utterly and absolutely devastating. And then we read that God's wrath turned from Him when He humbled Himself. Does this not speak to the power of humility? You know, humility is very powerful. And I would even take it a step further and say that humility is very attractive. You know, that's why we're attracted to the underdogs. Because there's a sort of a built-in humility with the underdogs. I, I think of the, the original Rocky movie, right? You got Apollo Creed. I mean, a picture of pride and pomp. And then you have Rocky Balboa. He's just so honored that he could be in the ring with Apollo Creed. You know, just, well, thank you for this opportunity, you know. And here's Apollo Creed. It's all a big show. And I mean, it's not long before you're just going, Rocky, Rocky, you know, kill him. Just you know, and why? Because we want the underdog to win. There's a humility that's attractive. By the way, this is why I believe it is that Jesus was so attractive to children. He was not intimidating to children. He was approachable. You really think about that. Aren't children usually intimidated by adults? I know they are with me. I mean, all I have to do is walk into the children's ministry and they, they kind of, it's just, I, it's, I was born this way, sorry. But, but there was something about Jesus that was so approachable and so attractive. And surely we see it with the rebuke of the disciples when they tried to forbid the children from coming to Jesus. To which he would say, don't do that. Don't forbid the children to come to me. Don't you realize that the kingdom of heaven is made up of such as these? But what was it about him that made him so attractive to children? I think it was his meekness and never make synonymous meekness with weakness. Jesus was meek. Meekness is strength and power under control. Meekness is strength and power under control. There are two characteristics that I think are the closest we can get to being Christ-like. We are never more like Jesus Christ than when we are loving and humble. Love and humility. We are never more like Christ than when we are humble. 
And humility moves the mighty hand of God. I think of that Proverbs that says that God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. He knows the proud from afar off. Listen, I got enough resisting me in my life. I surely don't need God resisting me. But if I'm full of pride, then he's resisting me. He doesn't want to be anywhere near me. He wants nothing to do with me. And conversely, when I'm humble, it moves his hand. And I'll say that it even blesses his heart. Not only does our humility move God's hand, it blesses God's heart. This is why the Proverbs are replete with promise after promise that God is blessed by our humility and that God will bless our humility. Let me just share a couple. Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. In other words, when I'm humble, that's when I'm wise. And conversely, when I'm proud, that's when I'm foolish. Humility brings wisdom. Pride brings folly. Proverbs 18.22 says, Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Pride will always precede the fall, without exception, without exception. Proverbs 15, verse 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Proverbs 22, verse 4 says, by humility and, here it is, the fear of the Lord. It's kind of like they go hand in hand. Humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. And Proverbs 3 verse 34 says, Surely he scorns the scornful, <laughs> but gives grace to the humble. And Proverbs 29, lastly, verse 23 says, A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. I'll tell you, I've never regretted being humble. And I've always regretted being proud. The most costly decisions that I've ever made in my life were made when I had a heart full of pride. And the best decisions that I've ever made in my life were when I had a heart of humility. Humility moves the hand of God, and humility blesses the heart of God. Verse 13, thus King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. Now Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. The city which the Lord had chosen out of all of the tribes of Israel to put his name there. This is one of many places in God's word as we've talked about in times past where God has literally put his name of ownership on Jerusalem as represented by the sheen. And if you look at the old city of Jerusalem, it is in the shape of the sheen. Literally, God has put his name of ownership on Jerusalem. His mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitis, and, verse 14, he did evil. And we're told why. Because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. Hang on to that. I want to come back to that as we bring the Bible study to an end. Verse 15, the acts of Rehoboam, first and last, are they not written in the book of Shemaiah, the prophet, and of Ido, the seer, concerning genealogies. And these are, again, books that we've heard about in Scripture that were not included in the canon of Scripture, simply because they were not needed. Otherwise, God would have had them included and preserved. 
And there were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. So Rehoboam rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Then Abijah, his son, reigned in his place. The chapter ends with a very important lesson that I think we would all do well to learn concerning Rehoboam not seeking the Lord. Another way to see it and even say it is that he didn't walk in the ways of the Lord. He didn't seek the Lord. He wasn't interested in the things of the Lord. Were he to have sought the Lord and walked in the ways of the Lord, we would be reading an entirely different account. You remember a while back we were talking about how there were only nine good kings of all of the kings in Israel and Judah. Nine. There were only nine kings of all the kings of whom it was said they did that which was pleasing in the sight of the Lord. And here's the thing. Of those nine kings, eight messed up towards the end. They didn't finish well. They committed some grievous sin. They were still good kings. But they blew it really bad. Save one. And of this king we're told that he was a good king. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And we're told that every day he would prepare his way and seek the Lord. In other words, he sought the Lord in all of his ways. He had an intimate and close relationship with the Lord. He walked in the ways of the Lord. He sought the Lord. And he finished well. Now is that too simple? <laughs> it is, isn't it? You mean to tell me that our ways and our lives can be blessed if we just but seek the Lord and walk in the ways of the Lord? Yeah. I wonder what our lives would read like at the end. Could it be said of J.D. he did that which was pleasing in the sight of the Lord. He sought the Lord all the days of his life. I hope so. I hope so. Here's the takeaway and we'll, we'll close. I want you to think about this because this again to me is why we read about kings like Rehoboam and all of these kings that did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. It's because we're prone to learn from the mistakes of others more than we are to learn from the successes of others. Oh, I wish it were like that. I, w I wish we could learn from the successes of other people. But <laughs> there's something about us, innate within us, that we just seem to learn more from the mistakes than we do the successes. And that's not always the case, right? I mean, would to God that we would learn from other people's mistakes. I would much rather learn, you'll forgive me, from your mistakes <laughs> than my own. I would rather learn and watch you and what you go through and learn from it so I don't have to go through that. But <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Sometimes we have to learn the hard way. I see the Lord as just saying, you know, there's the easy way <laughs> and there's the hard way. And what is it about us that we just have to learn the hard way. And sometimes we have to go through so much. And it's so needless and so unnecessary. God makes it so simple. Just seek me. Walk in my ways. 
serve me. Walk in obedience. Walk in humility. And I'll bless your life. I'll bless your life. Never imagine that God doesn't want to bless us. God desires to bless His children. But He can't. When as that hymn of old that says, when we're out from underneath the spout where God's blessing comes out. <laughs> Stay under the spout where God's blessing comes out. Why don't you stand, we'll pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for all the detail in your word. Thank you for not holding back and showing us all the reasons that kings like this Rehoboam suffered as they did, the consequences that they did, so that, Lord, we could learn and take heed to your word. Lord, thank you for your word. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.